So if you want to turn to 1 John chapter 1, we're not going to go uh, a great deal uh, into it. You, the heading in your Bible that says 1 John, uh, all of those headings are added later. So uh, we are 99% sure who the author is, but it's not an autograph. A lot of Paul's letters, he starts with Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, to uh, you know, the church at wherever. Uh, this one doesn't have that kind of address at the beginning. It's less of a letter and more of a instructional document. He's got some things he wants them to know, and so he sends them this document. But it, it's not as much as you would think about the New Testament letters as perhaps Paul's are. So it doesn't begin with the guy's name who wrote it. But by the time you get into the early 2nd century, 250, 260, there are lots of commentaries written about the New Testament. And pretty much all of those guys say that John the Apostle wrote this. Uh, so it, it, there's very little doubt that this is John Zebedee, John the son of Zebedee, the brother of James, who wrote this. Uh, and when you read the introductions to three different books that we know that John wrote, you can really see the similarities just in his mindset and the way that, that things start. So I want us to go and read John's Gospel, chapter 1, read the first few verses of that, then read 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and then go to the Revelation and read the first few verses of the Revelation. And you'll see that it's very, uh, the seams are very tight between those three. So run over first to John chapter 1. And we're going to read about eight verses there. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to that light. Then 1 John chapter 1, we'll look at about the first four verses. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father, and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and what we have heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. And then on over to Revelation chapter 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near." So only in the Revelation do we actually get his name, but you can tell that the same guy was involved in writing all these. So we're almost 100% positive. Didn't John positive. say he was a messenger? Uh, the, which is first John that didn't. Well, even in the gospel, his, he doesn't name himself other than uh, at different times he refers to himself kind of in the third person, as that disciple that Jesus loves. Uh, in 1 John, he never even does that. 
So it's it's church tradition, church history, uh, the ones who knew people that knew John. Like John had a uh, disciple that, that worked with him, followed him in Ephesus, Asia Minor, named Polycarp. And Polycarp lived past John another 30 or 40 years. Well, the guys who were writing those commentaries in the mid-200s knew Polycarp. And Polycarp told them, well, you know, I, I know that John wrote this. This is something that I was uh, aware of when John wrote it. So we have at least second-generation testimony from somebody who was around when it happened. And that, like I said, there's just very few people who uh, deny it at all. And usually when you run into modern scholars that deny the authorship of one of the books, it's not because they have great um, knowledge of who really wrote it. It has more to do with the fact that they don't like what's in it. And if you can say, well, it wasn't an apostle that wrote it, well, it's easier to ignore the thing. But if John the apostle wrote this, you better pay attention to it. This is a guy who had direct access to Jesus. I made a list of things that I know about John Zebedee. Uh, tell me what you know about him, just things that you remember about John Zebedee. He had a brother. He had a brother named? He was a fisherman, James. James, okay, he was a fisherman. What else? Wasn't he younger than some of the other he lived longer than the rest of them. I don't know how much younger he might have been than, than the rest of the apostles. But at the time that Jesus is getting ready to leave the planet, he tells Peter that you know Peter is going to be taken where he doesn't want to go and somebody will clothe him that he doesn't want them. You know, Basically, he tells him what kind of death he's going to die. Peter looks over at John and says, well, what about John? And Jesus says, well, if I want him to stay alive until I come back, what's that to you? So there's a, there was a rumor, rumor a, a mythology, even while John was still alive, that that guy wasn't ever going to die, that Jesus was going to come back before John died. So you can imagine the, the, the uh, problem they had in Ephesus when John finally did die, and they had to bury him, and they had to figure out, well, this, this was a rumor. This wasn't Jesus saying, that's what's going to happen. It's Jesus saying, what if... And when you read the end of the Gospel of John, it actually has a little disclaimer in there. Now, Jesus didn't say that he would live. He said, what if? So even at that point in time, they were beginning to, to have problems with folks thinking that that was a literal prophecy that would come to pass. Anything else? Well, he was on the right hand of Jesus at the Lord's table. Okay. Yeah, he was reclining against Jesus during the Last Supper and when they were going around the table saying, well, am I the one that's going to betray you? Am I the one that's going to betray you? Finally, they get hold of John and they say, John, ask him who it is. And so John is leaning up against Jesus. And I've always thought that was the most amazing picture. You know, they, they didn't sit at tables to eat. They reclined on their left hand and ate with their right hand, laying at, at very low, like oriental type tables. So John finished his dinner or was relaxing between bites and he was laying with his head over on Jesus. Just God in the flesh as your pillow while you're eating dinner. It's just the most amazing thought to me that John got to do that. He was at the foot of the cross. Uh, he was at the foot of the cross. Jesus looks at him and says, Take care of my mother, right? Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Well, there's a lot of things about John to, uh, to make us like him. There's a couple of things about John that you probably wouldn't have enjoyed. Jesus nicknamed him and his brother James the sons of thunder. They were probably loud and proud boys. They, they were or probably, they, yeah, they, they weren't passive. On one occasion, they were going through Samaria, and Jesus sent them ahead to find a place to stay for the night. And the Samaritans knew that Jesus was going to Jerusalem, so they didn't want him to stay in Samaria. They had a bone to pick, so they wouldn't give him a place to stay. 
James and John said, shall we call down fire from heaven and consume this town? And Jesus says, you don't know what kind of spirit you are. You don't, you don't understand what our mission is if you think that's the answer to the question. But they were those kind of guys. I mean, they were men's men. They were fishermen. They were rough and rugged. And uh, so there were some things about John that we might not have enjoyed as much, but he is known as the apostle of love. There's an old, old uh, mythology about him, and I don't know whether it's true or not, but when he was up in his later years, 90 years old, not too long before he died, after being on the island of Patmos, he's back in Ephesus, and they asked John if he wanted to speak. And John acquiesced, yeah, I'll, I'll speak. And so he gets up, and he gets to the front, and he looks at the crowd and he says, my brethren, love each other. Goes back, sits back down. That's, that's the whole sermon. Uh, so I like that about him. I mean, that's the kind of thing that, that you'd really, uh, really like to see. I've got, I've got another story to tell you that's, that's off the subject, so I'll tell you later. Uh, <laughs> about one of my professors at Harding Grad School. He he had a, a similar story about him. He, he liked Becky. I don't know if he ever got used to me or not. Uh, but the things that he wants us to know in the gospel and in 1 John all have to do with the problem of Gnosticism. And we've already mentioned the problem of the Gnostics, but I'll review a little bit. These guys believed that the one true creator God was way too holy to be connected to physical things. That matter was, in and of itself, evil. So they dismissed the idea that God could have become human flesh. Right? Whoever Jesus was, to them, he was born to Joseph and Mary, normal childbirth. And at some point, the spirit of Christ came on him. Uh, I think they believe that when he was baptized and the spirit descended in the form of a dove, that the spirit of Christ then remained on him. And that at some point prior to his crucifixion, that the spirit of Christ left him and went back into the heavenlies. They couldn't come to grips with the idea that an all-powerful God would allow himself to be born in human flesh, to become sinful matter to them. And live a life like that, and then allow humans to kill him. Uh, some of them believed in the resurrection, some of them did not. But they were connected to the churches, and they had gained some power in the churches. And as a result, John in his later years had to deal with it. Uh, in Asia Minor where he was living, some of these guys had gotten into the churches and had begun to teach. In one place he says they went out from us but they were never really part of us. He's talking about these guys. They, they influenced people to live lives that were loose because if matter doesn't really matter, if it's evil no matter what, then your spiritual is the only thing that's really important. So if you're spiritually okay then it doesn't matter what you do with your body. So when you're reading in the Revelation and you re run across uh, Jesus saying, I hate the Nicolaitans, it's the same, same mindset. Uh, that woman Jezebel, he talks about in one of the churches, same kind of mindset that just says, uh, it's okay to be in love with Jesus. He was a great guy. It's okay to want to follow Messiah, but don't confuse that with the way you live. The way you live physical things are just evil and you just have to deal with them. And as time went by, it morphed into some of those early days in the Catholic Church where uh, vows of poverty, uh, vows of um, chastity, all of that has to do with the body in and of itself is somehow evil. So we have to stop the body from doing what the body wants to do. So... Uh, and it's not just in, in Christianity, but um, uh, monks in Buddhism, monks in uh, Hindu religion have the same kind of mindset sometimes that, that the, the best thing they could do is deny the flesh. 
completely to, you know, to buffet the flesh to try to somehow keep it under control to some degree. All right. Uh, so to counteract that, John's got three things that I want us to kind of keep in mind while we're going through. Number one is the literal incarnation. Jesus actually became human flesh. God, through a virgin, has a child. Uh, the Gnostics denied that, and so John tells them in one point, uh, don't believe every spirit. Check the spirits to make sure that they're from God. And the way you find out is you ask them, did Jesus really come in the flesh? If they say no, have nothing to do with them. If they say yes, then they've passed at least that test to coming into fellowship. Um, when we baptize someone, and, and there's not a scripture for this necessarily that, that demands it, but we always ask them the question, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the God? Uh, would you baptize anybody that said no? You'd be up, up a creek, wouldn't you? you? You just assume that they're going to give you the right answer. But when you ask that question, you're assuming they're going to say yes. John says there were some in that generation who would have said no, that's not what I believe. I don't believe he literally became human flesh, that God really had a son. And he, he said you've got to, to steer clear of those people. You can't let them be part of your assemblies. They're blots on your uh, love feasts. You've got to keep, you've got to steer clear of those. So a literal incarnation, God literally taking on human flesh. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, that which was from the beginning, which we heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we looked at and our hands have touched. All right, so he wasn't an apparition. He wasn't some kind of ghost man that wasn't really there. He was actual flesh and blood. And, you know, like Becky brought up, John could say, I touched him, I reclined on him. I was right there. He broke bread and handed me the bread, and I ate it. He took the cup and blessed it and handed it to me, and I drank from it. Right? Literally the incarnation of God in the flesh. So that's the first one. The second one is that the true fellowship of believers is based in that. When we know that Jesus really came in the flesh, then we have fellowship with each other. So as we ask somebody, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, and they say yes, as they're entering into fellowship with us in a kind of a formal way through baptism, then they would ask the question, did Jesus come in the flesh? And if you get the right answer, then you have fellowship with each other. And then finally, it's not just fellowship with humans, but it's fellowship with the Father and fellowship with His Son. So if you want to have fellowship with Creator God, you have to have fellowship with His Son. And to have fellowship with His Son, you have to believe in the literal incarnation. If you don't believe Jesus actually came in the flesh, then you can't have any kind of relationship with Christ or with the Father. Those were John's parameters. And all through 1 John, you'll see that. He'll bring it up over and over again. He, he pounds on it. And in between talking about the problem of the Gnostics, he'll talk about love. He'll talk about keeping the commandments. But he always comes back to this idea that you've got to have Christ as truly incarnate if you want to have a relationship with the church and with when God you, and Christ. When you're going right. to baptize somebody, I usually warn them in advance. You know, I'm going to ask you this question. <laughs> this, this is the question I'm going to ask you. Uh, before I stand up in front of somebody else and ask them the question, I want them to know that, you know, that's where we're headed. And uh, like I said, I've never had anybody that batted an eye. That's an obvious, you know, the, to, to people that I know anyway. They obviously believe that that's true. All right, so let's look at these, just these first four verses. That which was from the beginning. So at what point does John believe that Jesus has his beginning? In the beginning. When, when you look at Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created. 
you've already got Christ. You already have the pre-incarnate Spirit of Christ. The Word of God is already there. The Logos, uh, that he, it's the word he uses in the Gospel of John, has to do with the wisdom of God, the Word of God, the essence of God, has always been there. Well, how do you get the essence of God into human form? Well, you take God and you unite him with a human, and the offspring then is wholly human and wholly divine. He brings Jesus through Mary. Hi, Tanner Hurst. We love you. Wish we could see you. Uh, he just graduated from, from Oklahoma Christian with his nursing degree. Good. So proud of that guy. Um, so when you're, when you're looking for a beginning point, John says you have to go all the way back to you know, pre-earth, pre, uh, pre-God speaking things into being. In his gospel, he says Jesus was the driving force. The logos was the driving force of creation. All things were created by him. Nothing was created that was created without him. He, it's all for him. When you read in Colossians, uh, everything was created by him, through him, and for him. And in him, all things hold together. So there's just, and, and again, this is, this is John who is mainly in the Jewish sector of the church. And he's saying the same kinds of things that Paul said to the Gentile sector of the church. I mean, it was universal. To be in fellowship in the first century church, that was something you just had to believe. Um, so we've seen it. We've looked at it. Our hands have touched it. We proclaim this concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We've seen it. We can testify to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. Uh, in the 21st century, we're stuck with second-hand information. I've talked to some people that really don't like the, the phrase uh, witnessing. People talk about, well, I was giving my witness. And they say, well, you, you're not a witness because you weren't there. Well, we can witness to our own experiences, but we can't witness to the original. John says, I can witness to the original. I was there when it happened. John saw him hanging on the cross. John was there on the first day when he had risen from the dead. He was in on everything. He was just a few feet from him in the garden while he was praying, let this cup pass from me. Was he in there during the, the trial? He was. He was one of two. Uh, I don't know how John got off so easy. But John knew the uh, high priest's servant. That's how they got into the courtyard. And if Peter had had any sense, he'd have gone the other way. But Peter goes with John, and John gets him in. I think maybe that the Zebedee family had sold fish to the high priest's family. I think they were, you know, a going concern. And so John knew people in the Sanhedrin. He knew people at the high priest's house. So when they get there, they get to the outside garden gate. They know John. So John is able to go on in and Peter goes with him. And somehow John goes through the evening and doesn't get asked all the questions. But Peter gets asked those three times. You know, do you, you're with Jesus. We can tell by your accent. We know who you are. And he just keeps saying, I'm not with him. I don't know him. I've never heard of him. And then he cusses somebody out to get away. And he goes out into the night and weeps bitterly. We don't know where John goes from there, but he's somewhere around. It seems like he just kind of hovered through that day, that he was somewhere close by Jesus until they get to the cross, and he's just right there at the foot of the cross. So a great friend. Uh, they were probably cousins. Uh, they were close, and John wasn't going to just go away and let Jesus die without him being there to at least witness it, to at least lend some kind of strength to him. Uh, so if you want to have fellowship, listen to us. We know what we're talking about. This is firsthand information. And then he says, if you have fellowship with us, 
you also have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So we're in good with the Father and the Son. And if you want to be in good with them, you be with us. We've got the connection. We can, we can help you have that relationship if you'll listen to the things that uh, we want to tell you. Jesus told the disciples something that, uh, and I, I'm not sure where it is. It just came to my mind. Uh, somewhere around John 16, I'm going to guess, he says, no longer will you ask for things from the Father in my name. You'll just ask the Father and he'll give you things. It's a wonderful little passage. So he's talking to the apostles and he's saying, you know, while I was with you, everything was funneled through me. And it's like, you go to somebody, you go to a best friend's house, and they treat you like royalty, right? They're going to give you what you want. They're going to be nice to you. And they say, whatever you need, you just get it in the refrigerator's right over there. Go ahead and get it. But it's still your friend's house, right? So if you want something, you're going to say to your friend, hey, you know, you think we could get those frozen pizzas out of the freezer? And your friend's like, mom, can we have the frozen pizzas? So you're working through that other somebody. Jesus tells his apostles there's going to come a time when you don't ask the Father, hey, would it be okay? You ask on your own because the Father loves you. That's an amazing passage. I don't know how far to take it as far as Christians are concerned, just general you and me kind of Christians, but he said it to the apostles on the night before he was crucified. So John says to these people, you want to have fellowship with us, believe that Jesus is incarnate. Let us tell you about the Jesus that we know. And we have direct connection, not only to Christ, but to the Father. Right? So we're in a place where we can help you if you'll listen to what we know. He says, we're writing this letter to make our joy complete. We want you to have what we have, and that will make us complete. So on the one hand, John is fighting a battle against Gnostics. On the other hand, he is encouraging and lifting up a group of young Christians who need to know that they've got it right and that they belong. So John says, stick with us. We'll tell you the truth. We'll help you stay connected in the place where you need to stay connected. So Lord willing, we'll pick up with verse 5 next week and talk about this dichotomy. He loves to talk about light and darkness, and it's in the gospel quite a bit. It's also in First John quite a bit, so we'll take a look at that. All right, we'll see you guys later.